School of Business, George Washington University. And I met George Soros through uh, one of our doctoral students, uh, Jishuan Hu. From China, he learned about George's work because George had set up a uh, foundation in China in the late 1980s. And Jishuan started reading George's work, said, Stuart, you need to read this. Uh, he's a second order cybernetician. And uh, so I did, and I decided, yes, he is indeed. And in fact, he had invented it all himself. I was uh, completely impressed with George's work in theory and philosophy. And so we had a few conversations and uh, kept in touch. Uh, the purpose of this meeting today is to give George some comments on his most recent book. And copies have been available in the Department of Management, Department of Finance. So. I'm hoping that we'll focus uh, our conversation on that book. But I thought I would also uh, make a few comments on why I think George's work is so important. I'm sure most of you know that he's a highly successful financial manager and an extremely generous philanthropist. But in my judgment, he's also a first-rate theorist in the social system. Now, economic theory is based on several assumptions about human behavior. For example, information is immediately distributed to everyone. Each person seeks to maximize personal profit, and human beings behave rationally. When asked whether they really believe such assumptions, economists reply, these assumptions allow us to solve problems, and if you don't make these assumptions, then you can't do anything. Although behavioral economics is making inroads, the situation in economics might be called a far-from-reality condition. However, in 1987, a new theorist wrote a book on his experiences as a financial manager. As a result of his work, he was quite aware of the inefficiencies in markets. He saw human beings as not efficient information processors or rational actors, but rather as acting based on bias and incomplete information. Further, he found that biases could exist in the market as a whole, not just for minutes or hours, but for weeks, months, and even years. Indeed, in the case of political and social systems, gaps between perception and reality can last for decades. The new theorist generalized his experience in markets into what he called reflexivity theory. The book describing the theory also described how he had used the theory to become perhaps the most successful investor of recent times. In other books, he explained how the theory could be applied to political systems as well as economic systems. For example, how the theory had helped him to anticipate and to influence the collapse of the Soviet Empire. One would think this new theory would attract great attention. It is more general than the previous theory because it can be applied to political and social systems as well as to economics and finance. It is more detailed than the previous theory because it explains how markets do or do not go to equilibrium. And it permits more accurate predictions as illustrated by the superior record in financial management. However, when I talk to people about the new theory, they often say that the propositions in reflexivity theory are widely known and understood. I think what is happening is that people are using common sense as the reference frame to evaluate the new theory. This is not the way science advances. Common sense is an unreliable reference frame for three reasons. Different people have different views on what common sense is. Common sense changes over time. And common sense is not clearly stated or documented. Instead, the appropriate reference frame for evaluating a new theory is to compare it with the old or accepted or well-tested theory. So what would economics look like if beliefs in perfect information, rationality, and equilibrium were replaced with bias, interaction between cognition and participation, gaps between perception and reality, disequilibrium, and boom and bust cycles? This is the theory of the economics created by this new theorist. Although the assumptions underlying reflexivity theory may make sense, they are not common. 
The situation may be about to change, however. And as our guest today has pointed out, during a period of dramatic change, those who get there first have a great advantage. So it is my great pleasure to introduce George Sachs. Okay, good. Uh, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would much rather open up the, uh, the floor and then make comments in response to what people say. And because, you know, I put my ideas forward in the book and the book has been distributed. So this is what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's more than, you know, 10 minutes uh, of, of introduction. Uh, obviously, you as second uh, uh, generation cybernetics, or uh, what second degree? Second order. Sorry. Second order. Uh, uh, are particularly interested in the theoretical part of the book, and it is, you know, uh, in fact, the uh, what I consider the neglected part, and you pointed, yeah. pointed out. So I'd be particularly interested in the, in a discussion. Uh, I'll, but maybe start with that, okay. the, the concept of reflexivity. And uh, of course, the, the, the reason I think that it is not accepted is because it doesn't, it's not really giving you as, uh, what could be considered scientific uh, uh, answers or predictions. It does not fit, the, we have a great proper scholar here, it doesn't fit the, the Popperian uh, definition of, of, of science which is supposed to give you predictions and explanations uh, uh, of some, some reliability. Because the, the world that I'm describing is in fact indeterminate. It's being determined by the people who participate in it through the decisions they make. And those decisions are not a reflection of reality. They are part of reality, shaping reality. So it, 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 that is it's an unpredictable world, world. It's an uncertain world. Uh, and of course, that, this uh, view of the world then leads to the concept of open society, which is based on the recognition of uncertainty and our uh, fallibility, our inability to, to understand the world as it is. So, uh, that then leads to the concept of open society, and of course, open society is an imperfect society <coughs> because it's full of uncertainty, and people can't cope with uncertainty. So they seek certainty in some dogma or or or, or some uh, ideology uh, that gives them reassurance, <coughs> and. Uh, the unfortunate part of those dogmas is that they are false, exactly because they impose certainty on an un uncertain world. And, uh, uh, you know, I could go on, but I just want to point out that it's, it's really been a great surprise to me that uh, the most uh, well-established, successful open society in the world, uh, the United States, has fallen victim uh, to this approach. I, it really was something that was very far from my imagination that it should happen, and it has happened, and that is, of course, the practical part of the book, or the more realistic part. But let's maybe stay, stay at, the, at the first part before we go on to the second part. I enjoyed reading your uh, graph. What I don't see right now is your theory of flexivity and the terrorism as a false metaphor. And I think there is a connection. So if reflexivity is looking at a system, a player, a multiplayer system, expectations, perceptions, influence, cultural aspects, uh, it seems as though terrorism is a master of using reflexivity, of using a system against itself. So in one sense, terrorism is an autoimmune disease of 
culture where the culture attacks itself. You use fear against the culture. You use the planes against the culture. Um,